I just want to say what a complete and total pleasure it is to have Gilbert uh, at Politics and Prose tonight, not only because he's produced another masterpiece of nonfiction, but also, and this is not just me saying this, this is a widely shared view. Uh, he just happens to be one of the nicest people on the planet. So Gilbert, we are really, really happy to have you have you with us. Um, his new book is his third. It's called Beneath a Ruthless Sun, A True Story of Violence, Race, and Justice Lost and Found. It's a story that takes place more than a half century ago, but it echoes vividly today. It is, as the title suggests, about the deep roots of racism and injustice in America, about attitudes we'd hope we'd move beyond, thanks to changing laws and changing social norms, but that actually and very sadly remain the unfinished business of our country. And so this book, at least to me, is not only important and compelling and just a great read, it's especially resonant and timely in the political climate of today, 2018. Now, at its heart, Beneath the Ruthless Sun is a a true crime story, and no one is more capable than Gilbert King of producing a riveting narrative about a crime in this case, the rape of a white socialite and wife of a citrus baron in Lake County, Florida in 1957. Uh, How many of you have read The Devil in the Grove? Okay, that explains partly why you're here. So for those of you who've read it, as you know, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 2013, obviously a bestseller. Um, You'll be reacquainted in his new book with some of the heroes and villains of that earlier story, and you will again experience Gilbert's mastery at unraveling a complicated conspiracy and exposing how unspeakable injustices and corruption become routine, normalized, and enduring. Um, Many of you know that Gilbert is not only an author of books, but has written about race, civil rights, and the death penalty for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Atlantic. He's a contributor to the Marshall Project and its work on criminal justice reform. And uh, because I'm standing here and have a microphone and a captive audience, I'm going to make one point of personal privilege, which is that Brad's and my daughter uh, is currently working at the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta. And I happened to speak to her today and I told her Gilbert King was going to be our guest tonight. And she, you know, just was flying off the walls and saying, why, I should have come home, I should have come home. Um, but she said that every co- every desk in the Southern Center for Human Rights has a copy of at least one of his books uh, on it, and that the entire, entire staff there views him as something of a deity. So... <laughs> Um, and one, one final thought about Gilbert, um, he was a professional photographer early on. And when he turned to writing books, he gravitated to stories that many people wanted to keep secret, that they wanted to have stay untold. And so excavating what really happened in these very, very difficult, tricky, complicated cases has been no mean feat. So how does he do that? And I suspect it has something to do with his training as a photographer his ability to sort of melt into the background, to get people to cough up the details and share information without feeling threatened. Obviously, he has acute powers of observation. And finally, he clearly has a ability to compose a portrait, to know exactly how to put together a picture so that people can see with greater clarity something that otherwise might have remained hidden and out of view. And that is just one of the extraordinary achievements of this book and all of his books, frankly. But please read it. We have plenty of copies. He'll be happy to sign afterwards. And please, most of all, join me and welcoming Gilbert King to PNP. Thanks so much. It's really nice to be here. Um, I recognize a few familiar faces, but many of you are new to me. Um, you know, actually, I have to say, it's really nice to come to Washington. I feel re- really safe here because a lot of the places I go are deep down into Florida where nerves are still a little bit raw about this case and, and the whole bringing up these civil rights stories. And uh, the very first time I went to Lake County to do a book talk was in 2012. And um, I was a little bit nervous about it because I knew that people in the story, their families were still in these areas. And I didn't know how it was going to quite go over. Um, And I saw all these cars outside in the parking lot. And I start walking closer to the place. And all of a sudden, this woman comes running out. And she goes, Mr. King, Mr. King, I just have to warn you, there's been two threats called in on the building tonight. Um, and then they said, but you don't have to worry. We called the sheriff's department and they're going to be watching. You. <laughs> what sheriff's department? <laughs> Actually, it was really, it worked out really fine. It was one of the nicer talks I did. Ended up staying two hours late because there were so many questions from the crowd and everybody was related to somebody in the story, good and bad. It, it went, went both ways, but it was, it was pretty interesting. But my first instinct was uh, this was going to be trouble. So I'm going to walk you through the story of Beneath a Ruthless Sun, and I'll tell you a little bit about 
the story itself and also the research that was involved, how I came to the story. And then I'll save some room at the end and we'll answer questions. And you can answer, you can ask any question you want about, you know, Lake County, because I really am now the authority on Lake County, Florida. <laughs> so basically this story is about a little town with a big secret. And it all takes place in this tiny town called Okahumka, population of about 300. The thing that's really interesting about Okahumka, there are three civil rights cases from about a 300 yard square, square yard area of Okahumka. All three of them reached the U.S. Supreme Court. So you think about that. It's one of the most important places in, in civil rights history based on how many cases get to the Supreme Court. And it's all in this little area, about two blocks size. It's just staggering that this happened. None of them are related. But to understand what was happening in this particular story that I'm going to tell you, you have to really understand a little bit of context. 1954, Brown versus Board, it's the landmark Supreme Court decision desegregating the schools. Um, what a lot of people don't forget, or if you haven't been born yet, you don't understand, is that after 1954, race relations took a very serious step backwards. Uh, race relations were frayed. They were damaged. Um, there was more and more violence. You saw the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Its population exploded. And then you had the birth of these white citizens councils throughout the South. Um, and these white citizens councils, Thurgood Marshall called them the Uptown Klan. These were doctors, lawyers, politicians. Um, they were not immune to violence themselves. Um, somebody described it as, as having the agenda of the Klan with the demeanor of a rotary club. And that was sort of how they went about business. It was all about separation of the races. And so you can see the reaction when you had the Supreme Court decision enforcing a way of life upon the South. The reaction was very, was very brutal. Um, not only violence, but just opposition. It changed politics. Moderate politicians disappeared off the landscape. You were either for segregation or against segregation. The Southern Manifesto came along. Uh, this, there was a very strong protest to the Supreme Court decision. And it really centered around the story they gave was that, well, it's, we don't want the you know, children going to school together. That's not really what they were afraid of. What they were really afraid of, it was one more step towards mixing of the races and miscegenation. Um, so they, they would couched it in terms of educational terms, but it wasn't. It was actually a sexual term. There was a, a fear that this was going to lead to the mixing of the races. And that's where the resistance really hardened. And this is you, in, in the fall of 1957, this is the famous Little Rock Nine case where the National Guard has to come in when the first African-American students are coming into the school. And you can remember that. Another very big uh, case that happened in, in the fall of 1957. Three months later, University of, well, the University of Florida is having its own segregation case that's gone. And this is a really remarkable one. This, is, this one begins in 1956. A man by the name of Virgil Hawkins from Okahumka, Florida, is trying to integrate the University of Florida's law school. And the, the Supreme Court demands that the University of Florida accept Virgil Hawkins. It's a mandate from the Supreme Court. And Florida just ignores it. They will not honor the Supreme Court decision. And so Thurgood Marshall called this the second civil war, undeclared civil war. This, this to him was like a remarkable thing that a state was actually not obeying the Supreme Court. And so at the beginning of this case that I'm about to describe, this is what's happening in Okahumka. Virgil Hawkins became the most hated man in Florida. That was the words they used to describe him. He was the man that was going to integrate the University of Florida. And the panic, even in the school newspapers and, and all the local papers in Florida at the time, was just one of panic. They were offering him free scholarships, fully funded to go outside of Florida because they did not want an African-American coming to the school. And so in this climate, the story begins in the winter of 1957. Um, Blanche Bozenkett Knowles, who you can see in this photograph with her husband, Joel, is sexually assaulted in her house late one night while her husband's away. And she reports to police that she has been sexually assaulted by an African-American, quote, with bushy hair. Sheriff Willis McCall, this is another shot of Oklahoma, the watermelon capital of the world. Sheriff Willis McCall, the notorious uh, sheriff, he immediately gets word of, of this attack, and he rounds up the usual suspects. He gets 24 African Americans, throws them in jail, starts interrogating them, starts narrowing down his suspects, and they finally focus their, their 
attentions on one suspect, an 18-year-old by the name of Melvin Hawkins, Virgil Hawkins' nephew. So this is going to be a major embarrassment to Hawkins' attempt to get into the University of Florida. Now they can embarrass him. The family is a bunch of criminals. And these are the kind of words that were going out in the newspapers. Hawkins' kin, rape. These are the words that are flying around. It's just not doing a great job for Virgil's chances. Then something strange happens. Two days later, they release all the African-American suspects quietly in the night, and they arrest a 19-year-old mentally disabled young man by the name of Jesse Daniels. Now he's the focus on the crime. Remarkably, they, can't, they have no evidence against Jesse Daniels. No physical evidence, so, and they don't think they can go to trial them. What do they do? They get a prosecutor, gets together with the judge and the sheriff. They even get his own public defender, who is also a former state attorney and very good friends with this tight circle of men. They get together and they say, we're going to declare him insane, not give him a trial, and throw him in Chattahoochee, which they do. This was something that was done a lot in the South. It was using law enforcement as a weapon, um, using the mental institutes as, as a weapon. In other words, if you didn't have enough evidence to, to, to um, bring someone to trial, you throw them up in a, in a mental institute. It's worse than a prison in many cases, and they can never get out. Even if it's a 10-year sentence, they'll stay in Chattahoochee for 20 years. And so they were using these mental institutes throughout Florida, throughout the South, and throughout the country, for, the matter, for a matter of fact, as just closing houses for tricky criminal cases. And this one fit the bill. In Lake County, there was a, a reporter by the name of Mabel Norris Reese, who you can kind of remember from Devil in the Grove. Mabel's interesting because she comes down from the North and she sort of buys into this idyllic version of pure race relations. It's a great place. And that's what she writes about. She's friends with the sheriff. She's writing this sort of line about how great it is to be in Lake County. There's no better place for black people. At one point she wrote that. Um, but then when Willis McCall shot the two Groveland boys on the side of that road right before the evening of their retrial, that's when she turned. She just, at that point, she said, I can't support this man anymore. And she kind of became enlightened, I think, by the fact that she was um, ignoring reality around her. In fact, at one point, the Supreme Court, in the first Groveland case, the Supreme Court kind of stepped on her. And they said that the media coverage was so biased pointing basically to Mabel, that this is the reason it's being overturned. And Mabel said, I deserved it. My reporting on that was terrible. Um, but at that moment, she decided that she was going to start standing up to Willis McCall. And she did. She ran all these stories, every single civil rights abuse in Willis McCall's domain. She reported on it, uh, much to her um, demise. I mean, here, one of the things that she starts with on this particular story she begins to get a sense that something strange is going on. First, they, they arrest Melvin Hawkins, the, the nephew of the civil rights activist, and then all of a sudden release him and arrest a white person. That didn't make sense to her. And she began to have a sense that in society, maybe it would have been preferable, because this was a very wealthy family, maybe it would have been preferable for Blanche Bozenkett Knowles to have been sexually assaulted by a white person rather than a black person. And so that's the thing that she begins to think about. And she's starting to write about it a little bit. And she can't quite figure out. She knows the how. She knows Jesse Daniels is innocent. But she doesn't quite know the why of it. But she has some strong intuition about it. Mabel's reporting in Lake County after Brown versus Board, she had a cross burned in her front yard, midnight visitors. Her house was bombed twice by the Klan. Uh, while she was away, they snuck in through a poison stake with strychnine in it, poisoned her dog, killed, killed Cubby the dog. And, um, and she also had her office completely damaged. It, it got worse than that. Over the years, Willis McCall and his friends got together, opened up a, a newspaper to compete with Mabel's newspaper, went around and threatened every single advertiser saying, you can no longer advertise with Mabel's paper, and basically ruined her financially. And so she had to leave town. She traveled to Daytona Beach, 50 miles away and had to become a reporter. But the remarkable thing about Mabel, she stayed on this job and she knew that Willis McCall was up to no good and she still kept writing about him. And she won awards. She was a fantastic uh, writer and she covered a lot of uh, events. I want to talk a little bit about the research because I really cannot tell you how lucky I got in this particular case. I had met with um, Mabel's family and, you know, my first question is, did Mabel save anything? Because 
much to my consternation, when I started doing some research down in Lake County, all of the Mount Dora topic papers, this is Mabel's paper, every single issue, hard copy and microfilm existed, except for one particular year, beginning in 1958. Suddenly that year disappeared, not just in the hard copy bound newspaper, but in microfilm in two different libraries, gone. Um, I honestly suspect that, that, that there were people that wanted this story out of there and Mabel was the only one writing it and it, this disappeared. And so that was a big problem because Mabel had written dozens of stories about this case and I knew I was never going to get access to these. Um, Mabel's daughter passed away about two, two years ago and I got a call from her granddaughter and you know, I said, I'm really sorry to hear about your mom. That's, that's terrible. And she goes, well, I was, I was upstairs in mom's attic and I found this box and I opened it up and it's all Mabel's stuff. I remember we told you we didn't have anything, but we have this one box. It's not very big. And um, I went down a couple of days later in this box. The only thing in this box basically was the Jesse Daniels files. She knew that this was the case, and I think she fancied herself maybe writing a book about it someday. She had all the correspondence with all the people involved in the story. Uh, she had all the original drafts on onion skin paper of all those stories that I knew I was never going to see. They were all there. And so this really opened up my world because it was hundreds of pages in these files. Another thing that happened to me, which was you know, remarkable, that same night that I told you about when I had the threats come in, um, this elderly gentleman who you see in this picture, Evie, Evie Griffin, he came up to me at the talk and he stuck his business card in, in my face and it said Sheriff of Lake County. And I said, oh, Jesus, here we go. Um, and he says, you got your book right, but, you know, there's more down here. You, why don't you write about this? And he told me this case of Jesse Daniels. Um, and then he said, no one's going to talk to you about it, though, but I'll tell you what happened. And, and he had he was haunted by it because he said we framed an innocent man. And it was still haunting him these years later. And so he told me everything. He told me how, he, how they framed Jesse Daniels, what, how they went about doing it, all the different tricks they did with the evidence and, you know, pulling a gun on him and getting him to sign a confession that he couldn't read. That was one of the things. The great thing about Evie is he did something I think is remarkable in the South. He turned in his fellow deputies who had manufactured evidence, evidence for two men who were falsely accused of rape. These two African-Americans were two days from going to the electric chair and Evie Griffin turned them in. And the FBI did an investigation and found out and, and concluded in their reports that these EPDs had manufactured evidence to frame these two men. These men were about to die and Evie Griffin turned them in. So it was the end of his law enforcement career, as you can imagine. I mean, he had crosses burned outside his house. He had mock graves put up. He was never far away from a gun. He constantly getting death threats. And this went on for decades. And he lived there. He stayed in it. He lived in the same house he was born in. And um, he was a really deep resource for me. And I put this picture up there because he just passed away last week. And, uh, you know, one of the saddest things is I really, well, I think he really hung in there to get a copy of this book. Um, I would get calls every other day like, Gilbert, how's that book coming? <laughs> and I finally got it to him. And his family, his two sons, read it to him at his bedside. And they said he was smiling in parts. I said, there's some parts he's not going to smile at, but we won't talk about those right now. And there he is, a great picture of him today. Still has the same old police car that he had in 1957. He holds a grudge. Let's put it that way. <laughs> one other thing. This doesn't make any sense, but I'll explain it. I'm on Facebook one day, and somebody contacts me and says, hey, I really like Devil in the Grove. Um, Terrific book. I used to do some stuff down in Lake County and it's very vague about it. Um, I can't even talk about it too specifically because I signed a non-disclosure and about how. But anyway, yeah, I said, well, I'm working on a new book down there and it's about this. And he goes, oh, I know about that. And I said, yeah, but the problem with this is all the files are missing. There was a flood and three years of files from this particular agency are missing. And he goes, yeah, I got them in my garage. <laughs> He said, I was fascinated by this case. I made copies of everything. <laughs> so again, a couple weeks later, I was down there um, going through his files and everything that I was told was lost. And I'm not kidding you. There was smoking gun material in these files. It was unbelievable. I never would have gotten this stuff. Um, so thank you, Facebook. I just, um, you know, feel free to sell my personal information to anybody. I don't, I don't care. I signed a, that non-disclosure with Michael Cohen, too. So it's airtight. <laughs> what am I talking about?
Also, I have to say the people that I, I've met with in Lake County, I was told initially that nobody would really talk to me. And, you know, I found out if you ask sometimes, they actually will talk to you. And, you know, it was, it was definitely uncomfortable. I'm asking family members to talk about something really painful in the family's past, to just put yourself in this situation. Some New York guy comes down to your house and says, I want to write about the worst moment in your mother's life. Can do you mind talking to me about it? Um, so I have nothing but respect for them because they did talk to me and I, I think it really helped me create a more sympathetic and, and rounder picture of what it was like to live in these times. One of my great regrets in the last book that I wrote, Devil in the Grove, was that I went down and asked Norma Paget to talk to me. Um, she was the alleged victim in the, in the Groveland rape case. And she thought about it. I was like standing right outside her trailer park and we we're having this little conversation between the windows. And, um, you know, I, I said, I don't really want to ask you personal questions, but I'm curious, you lived through this really important civil rights case. Thurgood Marshall came down to your town and, you know, do you want to talk about that, what that was like to live through this? And, and her message to me was let sleeping dogs lie. And I actually really regret it. I think the book would have been even better if I had been able to sort of get her voice in there a little bit more. The only thing I had in her voice was her testimony and some of the things she said to the FBI, they didn't quite line up. So I have to report that, that there's a difference in the testimony. And, um, but, but the, so that was one of my great regrets is that uh, she would not talk to me about this. But in, in this case, I really was able to speak to just about everybody, um, all different sides. And I think it really enriches the book. And um, another picture. Uh, <laughs> OK, I knew that I knew there might be someone from this family here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I saw the hand go up. I said, ah, okay. The Bozen cats are here. Um, this is a great picture. The Bozen cats used to, um, go on, um, vacations to, to Ormond beach and they would all get together. And I, I put this picture in there because there's two, two people in here in this photograph who actually helped me with my research. Uh, the young shirtless man in the front was Blanche's younger brother. And he was the sweetest guy in the world. And I, I located him in St. Louis. I went down there and spent about three days with him and just learned so much about what it was like to grow up on this estate called Fair Oaks, which is like nothing you could possibly imagine in Florida. It's this 11 room mansion built by the British who had come over to sort of establish themselves as citrus people. And all of a sudden they're bringing their British mannerisms and their uh, horses and it was really just an incredible thing. You couldn't imagine that it was in Florida, that this place existed. It was, it was really quite beautiful. And also in the middle, there was one of Blanche's cousins, Priscilla, who has, has become a very good friend of mine. She's still around up at living in Connecticut. And, um, and she was able to tell me all sorts of things that were so much, so much detail about growing up with Blanche because I really wanted to complete a full picture of Blanche and not just have her sort of be this shadowy, figure like like Norma Paget really kind of appears in, in the in the last book. So one of the things Mabel does is years go by and she's able to bring a lawyer into the case. After many years, Jesse is just languishing up at Chattahoochee, not doing very well. Richard Graham, just out of law school, doesn't know what he's doing. He's terrified of Lake County, but he's gotten involved in this case and ambitious. He files for the U.S. Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sends back an order to show cause to Florida. And this sets the wheels in motion. Mabel is really a badass. I mean, she really, the one thing she did after she was kicked out of Lake County, she went to St. Augustine in Daytona Beach. What's happening in St. Augustine in the early 60s? Okay, this is the beginning of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mabel is reporting on the Klan that is coming in and just basically, they don't like these protests. They don't like these segregation protests in the city of St. Augustine. And so there's starting to be these clashes and they're happening at night because it was so hot during the day that they decide we can only protest at night when it's a little bit cooler. And so here you can see hanging up the Confederate flag outside the famous Monson Motor Lodge. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers this particular picture, but this sort of gives you a sense of what was happening in Florida off the radar. Florida was seen as south of the south. So a lot of the things in civil rights that you hear about in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, those are sort of household names on some of those cases that we all know about. Uh, the things that were happening in Florida, people aren't quite familiar with. Um, there was a wade-in in the pool at the Monson Motor Lodge. And so this is the owner, James Brock, taking muriatic acid and pouring it into the pool. Outside that pool, the Klan was there with alligators in pickup trucks. And they were getting ready to dump them in there. I mean, this is Florida. for you. It gets weird down there. 
these are the clashes that are happening on the, in the wade-ins on the public beaches, okay? African-Americans gathering together peacefully, protesting, and all of a sudden the Klan just descends on them. And every day, day after day, beatings in the water. Police had to break it up. Um, it was becoming unbearable. Um, it was forcing, uh, the, it was on television at night. So it was one of the things that people were starting to really pay attention to. Um, Martin Luther King went down there um, and he said, the famous quote, if it takes all summer, we're going to desegregate this, this town, the city of St. Augustine. But he was met with violence. Um, you could see his, the cottage he was staying is shot in. Mabel is there right on the front lines of this. And she's reporting on this and she's become friends with Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King keeps her around basically because Mabel has experience with the Klan. And so at one point they have this conversation and, and King is like, if there's anyone you know that we can talk to, we don't want any more violence. We want this to stop. But the law is the law. And it's just a fascinating summer of, of 64 uh, building in this other part of Florida while Jesse's languishing. I'm not going to go with too many spoilers uh, to give you the, the test, but I can tell you that Mabel gets reinvolved with Sheriff Willis McCall and, and that comes up again. I can tell you that maybe Jesse Daniels, um, after 14 years at Chattahoochee, fi finally has his day in court. And maybe 50 years later, Jesse Daniels will sit down with me and his lawyer and go over this case and sort of share this entire story with me. Um, this is a picture that was just taken a couple of years ago. Jesse Daniels is now in an assisted living facility. Um, remarkably, he was, he was described as mentally disabled. That was the polite way of putting it. That was in the 70s. What they described him in 1954 were, they had three terms for this. Uh, you, were, you were categorized from a 1911 um, test, psychological test, and it was based on your IQ score. So by your IQ score, you were either a moron, an idiot, or an imbecile. Those were the three medical categories that show up in the papers. Um, Jesse was um, considered an idiot based on his IQ between 25 and 55. Um, a remarkable thing about Jesse is when you talk to him, you realize he's definitely mentally disabled. Uh, however, he remembers things. It's always almost like Rain Man. He would say names, dates, uh, events and describe them so perfectly. I said, he, he's just guessing at this. And I'd go home and check my files and he was right. Times I thought he was wrong, he was right. And that comes up in the book a couple of times when they're testing him for his sanity. Um, so he was much more helpful than I really expected. Um, I'm going to just sort of stop it here and then we'll, at, we'll take some questions. And uh, I think um, I, if I tell you too much, there's a lot of twists and turns that kind of come at the end. And I, I don't want to give those away because they are kind of interesting to read. I, I can tell you there's one moment in there that you'll think I made it up. It's that close to a novel. It's, it's, it's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen happen in a courtroom. And it's in this case. And I thought before this, the most unbelievable thing I ever saw in a courtroom or read about in a courtroom was Jesse Hunter, the prosecutor in Devil in the Grove, doing his summation before the jury. And he's a little worried because he's going up against Thurgood Marshall this time. And so he's thinking, maybe this is a chance I might lose. And he leans into the jury and starts to give a sob story about how he's been stricken with a fatal disease and he would hate to go out with a loss on his record to the jury. That was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. And by the way, Marshall and his lawyers did not object to that. They had given up by that point. There was just so many cases of prosecutorial misconduct. So I will uh, open it up for questions. Anybody want to start? It's always the first one that's the toughest. Well, I'll start until somebody, come on, you guys are not, you're <sighs> not showing your something. P and P colors here. Um, no, I, <laughs> you know, I do think that the, the, this book has so much resonance today. It's, it's takes place a long time ago. Same with Devil in the Grove. I think if you take those two books together, right. you have, a, you can develop an incredible understanding of the root of some of this resurgent attitude that we're seeing today. How much of that were you thinking about when you were writing this? I mean, was that, were those par parallels being evoked? I mean, can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, there, there were a couple things that popped up in the in the working of this book that it, it really honestly did not occur to me at, at one point. The first one is sort of obvious now, but um, with Mabel's battle up against Willis McCall, I mean, this is constantly going back and forth, and she'd come out with a new story, and, and, and he would say, she's just cussing me for being a white man. And then she'd say, that red Mabel, she's got a, a hind as red as a huckleberry. She's a communist and a liar. And it was just... Fake news. That's what she was assaulting her with constantly. And, and the, the amazing thing is all the other papers in, in the area kind of buckled and they really went along with Willis McCall. But it was Mabel, really one of the only 
uh, reporters in Florida at the time who was willing to stand up to McCall and call him to task. And when I talked to uh, Jesse's lawyer, Richard Graham, he said he was terrified when he got to Lake County the first time because he sees this big man in a hat staring everybody down. And Mabel's like, walk behind me. And she just walked right at him. And I just thought in 1950s, this is happening. I mean, it's just it was staggering to me. But she was she was just she would not back down. And it was it was such a great relief to have a female character who's doing some heroic stuff. That to me was one of the greatest things. And also the, the combination of, of Mabel and Pearl together, this friendship that that just, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. Jesse's mother is is poor she works as a melon picker and yet she's out there trying to solve the crime poking around going around getting signatures interviewing people um because she can't afford a lawyer she's realized she's got to do it herself she's writing letters to j edgar hoover and she becomes such a nuisance to hoover that hoover finally writes back to her and says all right we'll open up a civil rights investigation like just to get her off his back but um those are some of the, the topics i think that were more time i think the other thing is you know, we, we were used to seeing now a lot of exonerations because of DNA. And all of a sudden, it's like you sort of accept it as fact that, wow, was there possibly a conspiracy then? Like, how did that guy get convicted when it was somebody else's DNA and he confessed? And then you start to realize in this day and age, it's still happening. Uh, it's not very difficult to get someone to confess to a crime that they did not commit. And there are statistics that bear this out. Um, if you get to the point with you anyone under 20 years old with a mental disability, if they're innocent, they still confess at an 85% rate. So think about that. It's just very easy for police to do this. And when you start dealing with mentally, the mentally disabled and the people who can't afford lawyers, it's, it's staggering. Um, and so this is, I think, the thing that you really become aware of is just, you think the criminal justice system is still carrying forward some of these problems that we're still dealing with in terms of convicting or wrongly convicting innocent people. Um, just imagine what it was like back in the day when you could use a mental institute to avoid going to court. Um, it happened all the time. These mental institutes were jam packed with people um, facing charges where the cases were weak and they could lock them away. And it would be just the same as as uh, incarcerating them in a the state prison, except worse. They might get a lobotomy an ice pick lobotomy. They might get uh, Thorazine until you're just in a drug stupor. You might get the electroshock therapy constantly. And then these are the tools that they were using to sort of sedate the patients. Um, my question is about uh, Blanche. So is it a spoiler? Can you talk about... I can talk a little bit about it. Who who it was or... Well, yeah, she that's... Lied or that's the really interesting thing about it. Um Mabel, this is this is part of the story. I won't go all the way there, but interestingly enough, Jesse Daniels gets put away in a mental institute and then another rapist strikes in that same area and it fits the exact pattern. And Mabel has a hunch that why is the sheriff's department not connecting these two cases? They have no interest. A rape, rape that happened two months afterwards that looks exactly the same where the, the attacker undressed down to his socks and snuck in through the screen door exactly the same. Um, uh, they're not making a connection. And Mabel figures it out. Um, this gentleman gets arrested by police and she starts to interview him. And I won't tell you too much, but uh, it's pretty fascinating. So I think I, to me, that to me, that solves the case. But, you know, you have to you have to read and see the twist itself. I don't want to give too much away. But yeah. Anybody else? So Gilbert, I have a question. Yes, sir. One thing that um, intrigues me is how these um, these cases that like you've unearthed David Grant, unearthed uh, another one in his Killers of the Flower Moon. These cases that decades ago made headlines, sometimes involved Supreme Court cases, or the FBI or whatever, national news, then they get forgotten right. for years. And it, it takes you know somebody like you to come along and unearth them again. But but but. Why do some cases get forgotten and, and, and others and others don't? That's a great question. And I can tell you I have a really a really good answer for that because I, it's something I struggle with trying to come up with an idea for a new story. And so I find I'm going through old newspapers. One of the one of my sources for these are the, the black newspapers, Pittsburgh Courier, um, Chicago Defender, and there's smaller ones, Florida Star, uh, Baltimore Afro-American. 
these are unbelievable resources for finding out what's kind of really happening in, in the country because a lot of the mainstream newspapers are not going to print some of these stories. Um, they get tired of re writing about civil rights. It's funny that the stories get killed because it, Life magazine used to have civil rights atrocities and then there's like dial this back. It's just a, too assaulting. And so the, all these cases sort of got killed um, from coverage. And but the, the African-American newspapers were still reporting on them. And a lot of them had unbelievably good writers that couldn't work for any of the white newspapers. So they're working for these papers. And you look at their reporting. It's amazing. So those are the stories I kind of tend to focus on just to see the ones that are sort of forgotten. But in answer to your question, the, the real culprit here is that a lot of these stories are interesting newspaper stories and you get a sense of what might have happened but there's not really enough to do the kind of rich reporting that I want to do for these books. What really makes a difference is there has to be some kind of DOJ involvement. There has to be a civil rights investigation that creates a line of paperwork so or, or an appeal. So if somebody like Thurgood Marshall comes in and takes your case, all their lawyers go out and interview all the witnesses and all the records are right there. Um, to me, the, the greatest thing I've ever had, any kind of resource, has been the FBI files. Um, when you see these, because the agents, no matter what you think about the FBI and their reaction to civil rights, because honestly, they got a really, civil rights was a really difficult thing for the FBI to get involved in, mainly because they would put together pretty tight cases, and then they would take them to the U.S. attorney, and the U.S. attorney could not get indictments because people in the communities were not willing to go forward with these cases. And so it was a problem. And the FBI felt that they were getting a black eye. I don't think they were really racially enlightened anyway. I mean, Hoover used to brag that he had two FBI agents and uh, Marshall pointed out they're drivers. They're not agents. But uh, but going back to those FBI files, I, what's really fascinating then is that they had a relationship with these agents and, the, and local police and they would talk to each other really candidly. And sometimes they think they were going off the record. And so they'd come in with a statement saying, oh, yes, I arrested so-and-so. Uh, he had bruises and welts and he was bleeding. Perhaps he got in a fight right before I arrived. That would be his official statement. And then underneath that report, it says, off the record, the deputy told me it was so-and-so and so-and-so who did the beating in the jail. And so they think they're going off the record to the FBI. And I thought to myself, who's so stupid that they think they're off the record to the FBI? But the truth of it is they didn't have anything to fear because these cases were never unsealed. Uh, a lot of times I'm the first person that's requested these cases. And they, I, I'm opening original envelopes with like bullets inside them. No one has really seen them. So they were kind of hidden away from record. Uh, FBI would say it's, it's still under investigation. And so no lawyers ever saw these things. But those documents, the FBI documents, are extremely thorough. And maybe the cases never went anywhere, uh, never led to any kind of indictment or was quashed which that happened all the time, um, the records are in the files and they really, they interview everybody and it's like pieces of a puzzle that, that come together. So that's really the longest answer I could possibly give to you. But <laughs> but that's what it is. You, you can't just go with the newspapers and maybe hope that some people are alive. There has to be a trail of records of people's words in that time, I think, to make it interesting. But why do some of these cases get forgotten? Oh, in terms of why they're forgotten? I mean... That's a good question. I frankly could not believe that the, the Groveland story was for, like that to me was much more dramatic than the Scottsboro Boys. Everybody knows the Scottsboro Boys. My only answer is that my experience is I'm doing these in Florida and Florida was perceived as south of the south. And I just think that we didn't really think of this as a southern atrocity when we were thinking about the civil rights. It was just something that happened elsewhere. And so it just wasn't on the radar. I don't have a better explanation for that. Some of these should not have disappeared. I found a a case in Florida of a, a case that was, I think it was even, it was just as bad as Emmett Till. You know, a kid was killed in front of his father and they made his father watch and, um, and it was covered up and um, never went anywhere. And like, no one's ever heard of that case. And it was just a few years before Emmett Till, but you know, Emmett Till's case went, you know, uh, on the front page of everything. And this case just kind of lingered there and horrible. Anybody else? I do have one more question. Yeah. I'm waiting for everybody to get their thoughts together <laughs> to ask their own questions. Um, so, and this is, again, one of these sort of parallel to today kind of questions. You know, you mentioned, um, and everybody who's read Devil in the Grove knows about Mabel's kind of conversion, right. which seems totally impossible and implausible when you first meet her. Right, right. I mean, you just can't even imagine she's ever going to change. <laughs> um and then there are a couple of other people in Devil in the Grove who kind of slowly have, you know, bouts of conscience. Right. 
and obviously in this story as well. And so much of the restoration of justice depends on these people who, for whatever reason, when it seems highly unlikely, something happens that makes them sort of, you know, find the better parts of themselves. And obviously we're waiting for that to happen in many parts of Washington today. Um, <laughs> but no, it's an, int- I just wonder if you if you have any thoughts or ideas about what it is there, is it just the people and their personalities? Is there some triggering moment? Is it, is there a uniform? An- I mean, what is it that allows for that to happen? Because you hope when there are these kind of miscarriages of justice, somebody is going to eventually right. realize that they're going to have to live haunted by this for the rest right. of their lives and then risk all of the, you know, the stuff that happened to Mabel that happened to the deputy sheriff and so on. Right. Well, I think, you know, a lot of times if you didn't have a Thurgood Marshall in your corner, um, you were relying on basically court appointed defenders in a lot of these cases and the court appointed defenders for the most part, we're like the local citrus uh, lawyer who did business all over town, and now he's going to represent a young African-American in a capital case. How hard do you think he's going to push? And you look at these transcripts, and they basically say, defense attorney has no questions, does not cross-examine, um, does not object to all these things. And it's just it's sort of built into the system of, I hate to say it, it's white supremacy. It just it looks a little different. In this particular case, uh, just to keep this whole this whole structure of white supremacy alive, whites are being asked to basically compromise everything they believe in and values, perhaps. Um, they have to perjure themselves in court in order to support the structure. Because if a sheriff comes down, and, and, and you see it time and again in these books, where the sheriff is leaning on people for, to go with certain stories, and they expect you to go on court and tell those stories. And it, it becomes tra- traumatic for the people involved. I think that is a, cha- a, a, a changing point. I think it happened to Mabel because she was expected to go along and cover for the sheriff, and she wasn't going to do it anymore. Um, when Justice Robert Jackson gave his opinion In the Groveland case, he really made an interesting quote that wasn't quite really picked up among his other quotes. But he said, basically, blacks are so disenfranchised in this part of the country that you can't expect any African-Americans to come along and have power in order to fight back. He said what it would take for justice to happen in these counties is a white person to suddenly find a conscience. And he says that in his opinion in the Groveland case. And he says, and that's not going to happen. And it was true. If you look along the lines, you'd find these juries. I, I read the, the case reports of these juries that, you know, unbelievable evidence against somebody and they acquit. And they, they interview the jurors afterwards and they say, we got to live down here. What do you think we're going to do? Those, that's what they told the agents. Um, and so that's what the structure of white supremacy looks like. It leans on everybody. And Thurgood Marshall had a quote about it that I, uh, you know, it was never more relevant than, than when I was working on this book. He says, no one benefits from racism. And, you know, that was just one of those words that just sort of seems so lofty. And but when you when you look at it and what it did to like Jesse's family and what it did to these other families that were involved in this, uh, it forced them into these horrible situations in order to prop up this structure of white supremacy. So, you know, I read Devil in the Grove and really liked it quite a bit. I. But all these stories, you know, what they, I guess you're left with the sense that um, these people sort of got off with what they did, especially McCall. And so has there ever been any uh, movement to, to the state for restitution? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll just give you an update because in May I got invited to uh, Tallahassee because, interestingly enough, I find this inspiring. I'm going to tell this story. Uh, some of the... Um, legislators in Florida were reading this book in their book club. And and two of the men, Bobby DeBose from Fort Lauderdale, said, we have to do something about this. I'm going to put a bill up. And so he put forward, he started getting momentum. He's a African-American um, legislator. And he started getting some Democrats to support it. These young Republicans had their own book club, and they read it too. And they said, we're going to compete with you to see if we can get more co-signers, because we want the same thing you do. And they had a competition amongst each other to see who could get more co-signers. And this went at it for a couple of weeks and I got a call saying, you know, I think this bill is actually going to pass. You might want to come down here. We're inviting the, the Groveland families to come down to Florida. And so we all went down to Florida and we sat up in the balcony and the speaker of the house, Richard Corcoran got up there and he says, I understand we had a little competition based on a book club. 
And um, it was neck and neck for a while to see who had more. And we're going to offer you one more chance to settle the score. And he says, anybody who wants to sign, sign on as a co-signer of this bill, say aye. And it was unanimous. Every single legislator in, that, in the legislation um, signed on as co-signer. They had a vote. It was 117 to nothing. A week later, it was in the Florida Senate, 56 to nothing. Um, why did that happen? I honestly going to put my faith it's young people it was these young kids who just said this is enough this is wrong maybe we don't see this in political terms of left and right we're going to see it in right and wrong and i will tell you that that was the most inspiring thing about working on both of these books it was a lesson i learned from thurgood marshall he never really brought politics into these things he made these about american values right and wrong and when you look at his record before the supreme court the decisions he won were nine nothing they weren't 5-4, split down political lines. And it was because the stories that he told and the arguments he made were couched in language that you had to support them. They were American values about what we believe in the Constitution. And they were not, um, they were not divisive at all. And so I think I learned in my writing, like I try to do the same thing and not fall in any political lines at all and just sort of present these things in terms of American values and where we stand about what we feel this country should stand for. And it's a really effective way to make an argument. And I like to think that those young Republican uh, legislators just kind of picked up and said, he's not beating the hell out of us with his book, you know, telling us anything like that. He, they, they just went forward on the message of what the, what the book represented. And, and so we're that. I can tell you there's um there's the exoneration was supposed to be expedited. It's been about 11 months and it has not been signed yet. So that was part of the, the claims bill that they put forward to, for the apology on, on the state of Florida, that there was going to be an expedited um, exoneration. Those have not happened yet. Um, there's a lot of pressure happening. In fact, I'm going down there in May to do something with the Florida Innocence Project to sort of push it along a, a final step. I will tell you there's been only one posthumous exoneration in Florida history, you'll never guess who it was. Jim Morrison of the Doors, public <laughs> urination. He was the only person posthumously exonerated. Oh. So we're hoping that this case has even more significance than Mr. Morrison's. Uh, what, what about Jesse Daniels in terms of his, was there anything happening? Right, well, I, I, as you'll see in the end, he's, he's, he's fully exonerated and he's given, a claims bill is, is, is put forth, but there's some monkey business with the claims bill as you could imagine. And so he, he, he ran out of money pretty quickly and he's still alive. So um, it wasn't really nice what they did to him, but you, you wouldn't be surprised by it. <laughs> How do you explain the difference in the treatment between what they did for, what they did do for Jesse? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. I mean, the main difference of, uh, they just, Florida wanted the Groveland story to just disappear completely. Uh, and they were not going to, in fact, the official story this is part of the reason why you think the apology. What does an apology mean? Oh, they're all dead. What, what good is an apology? That, that was a common thing. When I sat with the families, they said the, the apology means everything to us because we continued to live in Lake County. And the official story was that our relatives were rapists. And then they tried to kill our great sheriff, Willis McCall. And so our names were mud in this community where we lived. We just want our name cleared. He said, we don't want reparations. We don't want any kind of compensation. We just want our name cleared. And so I was pretty inspired by that. When they said that, that they want an apology, then it was very easy to get on board with that. So. Gilbert, do you think part of the difference might be that there hasn't been a book until like this month <laughs> about, no, seriously, about Jesse Daniels where the I, book know, is clearly was read by these legislators and that's right. what led to the... I would say the book is the catalyst in a lot of ways, but also I want to get back to the young people again because there was a, a young student named Josh who was studying in his senior year at the University of Florida, and he was reading Devil in the Grove as part of his history class. And he said, I got to do something. And he started writing to these senators, and he was the one that sort of pushed this Florida senator or legislator, Bobby DeBose, from his hometown in Fort Lauderdale and got him to going on this. And so it was this kid, a 21-year-old kid, who, I mean, I, the book had been out for a couple of years. It was, it was really him that kind of pushed it along and got people reading the book again. So I, I have to say, like, I'm encouraged by that. And I think if you look in the books I write about, some of these stories that are kind of inspiring. The University of Texas is trying to keep blacks out of their law school. And so what they do is they take a basement of an oil company and throw some law books in the basement and say, that's our black law school, equal. Um, 
Marshall takes on this case and basically it becomes a case in, in Austin and all of the white students who were in that law school joined the NAACP in protest and they started booing their dean who said it was important for blacks to have their own law school. Uh, this is Texas and this is in the 1940s. Um, it was young people. I mean, they were just the ones and I think you see it today in like Parkland. Parkland, yeah. Right. Did you have a question? John? Uh, so I guess we have time for one more question. So I'll, uh, I was wondering if, uh, since these are so, so tied to really deeply exploring local communities, um, I was wondering if you had uh, been exploring where you grew up as well, and if you if there are any stories that you heard about when you were growing up or that you remember from growing up that you've thought about investigating in a similar capacity, or if there are other places in the U.S. that you've also looked at in, in this way. Oh, you think I could leave Lake County, Florida? No. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. I kind of grew up in an upstate New York bubble, and this stuff was not on my radar at all. And so I, I didn't really understand what was happening. When I started looking into these cases, I actually couldn't believe this was happening in our country. Um, it, I, one of the things I talk about is like I'd, sh I'd see these pictures of like the Jim Crow water fountains where it's, you know, separate or the separate entrances that African-Americans were made to use. And I, I began to think those photographs are actually whitewashing American history. They make it look like the separate water fountains. It's, it's rude and impolite to African-Americans. The words I would use to describe what I was finding were brutality and terrorism. And so this really opened my eyes. And I think as a storyteller, you know, the ignorance sometimes is a great tool, right? About what you don't know. This, this stuff was so surprising and shocking to me that, that this was happening in our country. Um, and this is the stuff that's buried deep that we don't like to talk about. I talk to people in Lake County and I get letters from them all the time. They said, I lived through this. My parents were in this case. I had no idea this was happening. Um, African-American families didn't know this was happening. Um, when I talked to the Irvin and the Shepherds, they just sort of had vague ideas. And the reason is African-Americans were trying to protect the children's lives and not share these awful stories of racism and violence because it would poison them. And so they said their fathers would never talk about this stuff. And so they grew up not knowing about things that happened in their backyard. I know that there's a lot of this, this kind of stuff out there. Um, I'm dying to find a good northern case to sort of attack because every time I go down south, people are like, come on, you think nothing was happening in the north? And I, I say, I know, I know that, <laughs> but I'm just waiting for the right story. But I think it would just bring a, a, a whole different... Um, whole different series of things to think about that it really I'm not thinking about in the South. And so if I could find one in my hometown of Schenectady, New York, that would be lovely. But I'm sure they're there. I just have, I haven't come across one yet. Right. Thank you, Gilbert, so much. Oh, and um, um, I please uh, read this book. The two together, as you all know, are an amazing uh, uh, group. So thank you, um, thank you so much, Gilbert.